Hello and welcome. The upcoming lecture by Dr. David B. Levy is entitled Internet Ethics, Curtailing Cyberbullying and Violation of Personal Privacy Post the 1984 Orwellian Postmodern Condition. The thesis of this lecture is that the time age old antidote and corrective to the problems of cyberbullying and breach of privacy on the internet can be remedied by recognizing how to curtail speaking Lashon Hara and Motsi Shemra as laid out in the Chofetz Chaim's Hilchot Isurei Lashon Hara Virechilut and seeking Musar guidance in Torah principles that guide Derech Eretz and provide the antidote to the Wild West irresponsible internet online behaviors. Responsible use of the internet is practically considered by marshalling rabbinic texts that support basic human dignity, values, and respect. Tried true Torah ethics that curtails honat varim, mean speak, causing halbanat panim, embarrassment, which is like murder, kishvichat damim, and striving for a purity of speech, lashon naki, b derech eretz kadma la Torah, c sanctifying Hashem's name, kiddush Hashem, d respecting all of God's creatures, kvod habriot, and human beings b'tzelem elokim, in the image of godliness. In this way, walking in the ways of Torah is viewed as the elixir to the present malice of internet immorality, including 1. Insulting, abusive language, baiting, hating, and name-calling. 2. Flaming, lurking, aggression, voyeurism. 3. Verbal fighting, sparing, incitement, stalking, trolling, grooming, to lull others into delinquent behaviors. Four, character assassination, ad hominem attacks. Five, conflagration or intimidation, hateful vehemence. Six, belittling, defamation and libel. Seven, obscene language. Eight, verbal harassment, recurring nastiness, personal malice or threats. Nine, venting and bloviating, all of which rupture Justice Louis Brandeis' classic formulation of the right to be left alone in peace. Thus, age-old Torah remedies are as relevant today as ever for fixing ethical behaviors. I hope you enjoy the lecture. Tonight's lecture is devoted to halachic ethical concerns of the online environment, the internet and halacha. And there are many new situations that um, warrant our application of old halachic principles to apparently new situations. So for today, um, the ease by which one can send an email or chat or instant messaging makes Lashon HaRa, Rechilut, and Motsi Shemra more easy to disseminate. So the thesis of this lecture is that um, by applying uh, the Chafetz Chaim, Silchot, Yisrael, Lashon HaRa, the Rechilut, the Motsi Shemra, we can receive guidance in Torah principles on how to curtail these online behaviors that are destructive and harmful to other people. Um, before we go to this particular angle and topic within online ethics, um, we should note there's other problems that abound with the online uh, technologies. For instance, the Cherem de Rabbeinu Gershom, the Light Unto the Exiles, uh, one of his three principles is that one should not read other people's mail. Well, we're long after 1984 and Big Brother is uh, abounding after the Patriot Act and the question arises um, how much government organizations or police organizations can monitor people's email and um, other types of communications, telephone for instance. 
And we'll be looking at that. Um, Rabbeinu Gershom forbid anybody to spy on another person's email. There are some few exceptions, but um, that's a general pr principle in halacha. Um, then there's the question of erasing Hashem's name on a computer screen. Uh, it's called uh, Mechikat Hashem, based on Devarim 12. And whether this applies to a computer screen, i.e. Lo Ta Sun Ken, is an Isr Chafitza, a prohibition pivoting around a physical object with a specific halachic status, versus pixel liquid crystals that glow in a cathode tube, of computer monitor via electron beams guided by a magnetic field uh, shot onto a screen. So obviously most post scheme would hold that the computer is not an object of Kedusha that a safer Torah would be, um, or that even a printed book with Hashem's name in it would be. And uh, we'll see how, uh, if we have time, the rabbis deal with that. There's another question in uh, online ethics about Internet commerce on Shabbat by Orthodox Jews. If a Jew owns a website, can his website receive uh, credit card payments over the weekend, including Shabbos? Well, it turns out the uh, Federal Reserve is closed on the weekends. So many post scheme would hold that that's not a problem because even though the site is processing the payment, the actual transaction doesn't go through till Monday. Then there's the question of employing filters for screening out Pritzis and Shtius and Narshkite. That's a whole separate lecture, perhaps, on itself. And then there's the um, question of Bittel Zaman, wasting time. You can sort of be lost in hyperspace. Um, then lesser important questions like davening from a Kindle or iPod, obviously not on Shabbos. What is the status of a minion, a cyber minion or a cyber mizuman uh, in the blogosphere? Uh, we have questions of piggybacking on another person's Wi-Fi or unsecured signals without authorization to access a computer network um, contracted by others, which harms the network in general, damaging others' data and diminishing bandwidth, which can affect the speed of connection for paying subscribers. Ergo, it's a form of Geneva, Geneva or, or theft of a person's speed of their internet that they paid for. Uh, then we have the question in the music industry of illegal film and music downloading, which can cause financial loss of royalties to copyrighted works, despite Minhago Shalom, Norman in practice, and Hamotzi Laor Yodea Mize, the author knew full well but making the work public, how it might be abused, and Umdena, common assumptions. Then there are many other questions of the internet um, that we will not have time for today. And as I mentioned, we want to focus on the question of the ease in which Motzi Shemra Rechilut and the Shana can be disseminated. And we will be looking at the model and paradigms of the Chavetz Chaim to curtail such unethical behavior as the panacea or the um, elixir that will um, help hopefully curtail these abuses online. A bullying, cyber bullying it's called. Um, the prohibition of slander, Motzi Shemra or Lashonara, gossip and rechilut or tail bearing can do great damage to people's reputations for a shidduch, for parnasa, or um, just their name. And so um, we look to the Talmud for guidance, which notes that causing halbanat panim or embarrassment is the equivalent k'ritzach. It's like murder or k'shifakat damim. And therefore we, to embarrass somebody by cyberbullying becomes the equivalent of a kind of murder. And the question for the Chavetz Chaim is what type of speech and action should we try to strive for? Uh, the Chavetz Chaim refers to Lashon Naki, uh, purity of speech, and that Derech Eretz Kadma La Torah, that just basic um, principles of common respect and dignity and um, uh, menschlichkeit should be applied, the Chavetz Chaim would say, to our online behaviors to affect the Kiddush Hashem and respect all of God's creatures, kavod habriot, uh, that are in the image of Hashem, B'Tzal Malakim. So let's get on to uh, the paper, the topic of the lecture. Um, the lecture is going to use the method of applying the Chafetz Chaim Tzilcho Yisurei Lashon 
um, to uh, our lives online. Um, the Chavetz Chaim obviously didn't conceive of the online environment, but um, his principles of ethical decency are very much uh, apropos. Um, that many people have noted negatives of the internet, uh, or is it counter Torah? Well, I think there's responsible use of the internet and irresponsible use of the internet. And there's internet that's treif, and there's the internet that's kosher. And we have to be sensitive to that. Um, from a non-Jewish perspective, Nicholas Carr, in a book called The Shallows, argues that the internet has fostered superficial reading and the inability to think, which is supported by Paul Cantor's thesis in a book called Leo Strauss Towards a Critical Engagement, where Cantor refers to a forgotten type of reading and writing and thinking and critical analysis. I refer you to that book for that uh, more elaboration on this. Um, but students have a shorter attention spans nowadays in general. Uh, they believe with the quick of a mouse that the homework assignment is done when the critical thinking and analysis may not have even begun. Um, so analyzing and immersing oneself in traditional learning becomes something that's very foreign to uh, the, 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 the um, uh, born digital generation um, in that um, they have been acclimated that la fumsara agra, according to the effort is the reward, um, they really don't have a concept of that because the, the click of the mouse you feel that your assignment's done and it really might have not have begun. And then social media like Facebook, um, where one can have you know thousands of friends, uh, really have vulgarized the notion of what friendship is. A friend is friend to the end. A friend one should be able to discuss anything with. For Rambam and St. Thomas Aquinas and Aristotle, the highest type of friendship is intellectual friendship, where friends dis discuss ideas and strive for the truth and the wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. So if one has thousands of friends on their Facebook account, uh, the notion of true types of friendship really is debased. Uh, the Masara teaches that Hashem spoke to Moshe, Panim el Panim, and Chavruta learning is a part of the yeshiva experience to convey a living Masora, and there's no uh, substitute for Osei Lecha not even a computer with an internet connection to great digitized collections, for instance. And the type of friendship that might arise in a fellowship of a yeshiva environment um, just doesn't exist on Facebook, put it that way. Um, and also there's the no problem of uh, the danger risk of being plugged into technology uh, makes one oblivious to uh, the real presence of the other whose face demands, I am here, behold me. Um, Hillel is what is, is said, uh, anipo akolpo. So to understand what that means, that means when Hillel was present, he was present there for the other. You know, um, he's not going to chase them away with the building cubit. He welcomed um, inquiry and people and treated every human being with great love and uh, avat Hashem, avat olam, and uh, avat Yisrael. And so when he says, I'm here, everything is present, that means I'm not distracted by the computer and its glitzy images, which um, have people tune out to the real presence that's demanding to be heard and that is before one. Um, now, there's jeopardizations of modesty online. I don't have to uh, mention there are immodest uh, photos and uh, videos that are sent around. Um, and uh, this is a debasing of the human being to an I relationship. Um, anonymity allows for malicious attack uh, so that kavod ha Torah, reverence for Torah leaders, and lumdis uh, can be threatened, and Jews can take pop, pop shots at uh, debunking and criticizing great Torah scholars. Um, and the online environment uh, can breed this type of insensitivity, loss of empathy, callousness, when one is alone in a room and does not see the other person to whom one is communicating. Uh, it can promote, it doesn't always, but can, cruel and sensitive and hurting communications and remarks of mean speak. Um, and often the Freudian subconscious risks turning into uh, a situation where people are humiliated in public on a routine basis by the push of a button of sending an email. Um, what in the Gemara is called Halbanas Bane Chavero Berabim. 
And so I mentioned some of these dangers of the online environment. Um, some people differentiate between kosher and treif sites. I think the real question is responsible use of the internet. In Midrash, Breshit Rabbah 65.1, Esau is likened to a, a chazer, which raises its hoof to say, See, I'm clean, because I have split hooves. Yet swine do not chew their cud, or ruminate, so they are not kosher. Some feel the split hoof of the internet is deceptive. The internet's like crying out, Look, I have split hooves, I'm, I'm kosher to use. But the caveat is how we use the internet, either responsibly or not responsibly. So caveat semter, buyer beware. Some sites on the internet are really just uh, degrading to the human being and being in the image of God. And the behavior that it can promote can be non-kosher behavior. That is the need for filters and other types of uh, things that we might wish to uh, distance ourselves that are freely available on the internet. Um, a lot could be said about these dangers. It, of course, allows for great um, possibilities too, um, but what do I mean by responsible use of the internet? Um, so, cheve mecha shev hefseid mitzvah keneged sachara from Perkei Avot 2.1. When determining the merit of any act, one must calculate gains versus losses. I'm not a big fan of that utilitarian ethic of the hedonistic cal calculus, but some people apply it to the internet. There's great gains that we can benefit from it, and there's great risks as well. So we have to weigh those in honest assessment. Do the losses outweigh the benefits? Yatsa Sakharo Um Another question. How can it be used to reach and educate uh, digital natives and little tech ninjas where they are uh, at? That is to say, Ba'asher Husham. Um, we have a phrase in the, in, uh, the Talmud, Chanok uh, Lana'ar Al P Darko, teach a child according to their way. So every child has their own learning styles and their own learning strengths, and the internet can be used to help that or can be used to detract from that. We must embrace the I generation, some people argue, rather than push them away, um, because uh, we must try to get technology spiritually in hand to, to do so, and social media to better understand the tech culture of the younger generations that have little tolerance for reading and thinking. Um, to teach how to be tech responsible versus just tech proficient by moderate, modeling proper use. Um, so for instance, many library schools are turning out people that know how to access information as cyber jockeys. The, the problem arises, there's a flood of information. So. The, the, what used to be the model of somebody that had actually read the content substance of the books and the journals, whether they be online now, databases or what, are less. And what we're doing is producing a population of uh, really automatons because all these people will be replaced by, um, quote, user-friendly environments uh, because what they're doing is just knowing how to access information rather than knowing how to analyze the flood of information and sift it and filter it and turn it into something created by sublimating its important uh, ethical guidance for today. Um, the art of reputation management uh, is a problem on the internet, conveying that the digital decisions ones make today will stay with them for the rest of their lives uh, can be a very important um, idea to convey to the young generation any old generation for that matter, when they push a button, they should know it will be around in hyperspace, uh, at least um, in some archival form. So uh, can we promote an intergrade communication, i.e. students entering contests designed by tweeting and hashtags <clears throat> to communicate about experiences on a field trip or after camp to unite students across all grades so that they, some of the shy students participate more through Twitter feeds and so forth and stay in touch via email, Facebook and Skype. That, that obviously is a potential there, but the question is that's no substitute for real presence, in time, reality, friendships. Um, so one thing about responsible use of the internet, boundaries and limits that prevent using the internet instance uh, for intruding on family time or for degrading things that can hurt people um, need to be set. So cyberbullying is a major problem. Bullying is not new, but cyberbullying is. The proliferation of technology has provided students with a new method of bullying. 
Cyberbullying refers to the use of emails, cell phone, text messages, instant messaging, defamatory websites to support deliberate, repeated, and hostile behaviors by an individual or group that are intended to harm or harass others. Uh, there's been many cases of high school students that have um, accidentally or been able to intercept uh, emails that are very uh, slanderous towards them and they get very depressed and they commit suicide. So um, th these are real cases that have happened. Um, and so the internet raises this question of bullying is much more easy now on the internet. Bullying has been around for many, so many generations, but new technologies make it easier to permeate uh, cyberspace by the ease of instantaneous communication facilitated by social media. Anyone with a computer or a smartphone on a social network can spread bullying at the click of a mouse. And that's a real problem, and that's why we need to return to our sages like the Chavetz Chaim, who gives us a compass and a GPS on how to put a lid on those, quote, Wild West, digital Wild West bullying uh, tendencies of the new generations through uh, modern means, postmodern means. So insulting, abusive language, baiting, hating, hate speech, that is, name-calling, flaming, lurking, aggression, voyeurism, verbal fighting, sparring, incitement, stalking, character assassination, what is called in Latin ad hominem attacks, conflagration, intimidation, hateful vehemence, belittling, defamation, libel, um, obscene language directed against victims, inappropriate tone that is not polite. General verbal harassment uh, on internet is, is a real problem of recurring nastiness and personal malice or threats aimed at a victim. So there's a slippery slope from venting and, and bloviating to bullying. Um, and we have to be sensitive to that. With the internet as a means of promoting bullying and slander, uh, never ha has it been more critical than today to understand Kedushin 30b. I have created the Ra and I have created Torah as its antidote and elixir. Our Masora offers guidance and definitions about proper perspectives that guide how we approach and use technologies and set limits. Our Masora teaches that Hashem spoke to Moshe Panim El Panim, um, and basically, Derech Eretz is required um, that Das Fishin Menschlich, the interhuman, cannot be replaced by a machine. Um, and uh, we must be attentive to acting responsibly with our internet technologies. Uh, some charts that I have. One of the charts is on the frequency of bullying um, amongst a certain age groups uh, 11 to 16 year olds for instance and it breaks it down in a bar graph by school internet cell phone and and other means um, and uh, so that's one chart that's very interesting taken from Amanda Lenhart's cyberbullying 2010 what research tells us and then we have a chart on the average quarterly revenues per user of various companies in 2012 uh, Twitter, Microsoft, Facebook, LinkedIn, AOL, Google, Verizon Wireless, DirecTV, Comcast, etc. And that's taken from David Goldman's You Are Only Worth So Much to Facebook. Okay. Now, um, we have pictures of anonymous trolls. Uh, that is somebody who's lurking there to trip people up and to create mischief and nefarious behavior. We take that from Netiquette and Online Ethics, Opposing Viewpoints. Uh, by Berlotsky, Noach, editor, that was published by uh, Gail Greenhaven Press. Uh, we have, what is the relationship between the internet and civility? Uh, that was a study that was done, I take it again from Netiquette, and Online eth Ethics Opposing Viewpoints by Berlotsky, Noach. Um, and bullies harassed by sending unsolicited, unwelcome emails, repeatedly spamming. So we have a chart on total spam emails traffic by month in a certain year. And that is taken uh, from uh, App River Threat and Spam Scam Report, July 2012. So, um, anting bullying measures ensure students' rights to safe, physical, and psychologically sound environment. Uh, students should have serious talks between parents and the school counselors about what constitutes behavior online that crosses the line. Uh, changing class or school of involved students uh, can also make a student uh, 
uh, in a risk category. Um, implement anti-bullying program of specific groups, uh, safe to tell program to teachers, etc. So there are ways schools are dealing with this. Let's get to um, possible solutions for cyber safety. Uh, not home road, but precautions. Enforce age requirements for certain sites. Have children share passwords only with parents. Review children's emails and web history. Nip in the bud grooming when someone initiates online contact with young person to the intention of an inappropriate relationship. Um, this includes letters, gifts, and phone calls to an unknown number. Encourage open lines of communication between children and parents. Teach children never to be share personal information, such as name, age, address, phone, social, security number. Never meet a person uh, in person who you've met over the internet. Uh, visit netsmarts.org to learn about internet safety. Friend your teens on Facebook to see who their friends are and what they're posting. Teach how to use privacy settings. Create new alerts for teens' names on Google, Yahoo, and MSN to protect their digital identities. Talk to teens about what is appropriate and not appropriate online. Using blocking software and filters. Keeping computer in public areas of the house. Talk to kids about the dangers of cyberbullying. So then we have a nice cartoon about teaching kids that if they would not say something to someone in public, they shouldn't write it online. Never send an email when you're angry. Um, so and there's a picture of an angry man with an angry keyboard cartoon by Tim Cordell from Netiquette and Online Ethics. So now I want to look at the, the Torah principles, which is the bread and butter of this talk. Rabbi Israel Salanter of the Musar movement wrote, Not everything one thinks should be said, not everything one says should be written. Not everything written down should be published. But with a click of an English, of an email uh, sent, it's going to be published in some way, in some sense. So that is a very risky situation. And anonymity and instantaneousness of the Internet often allows things that would never be said or even written go to public so that there's a blurring of propriety in Menschlichkeit. Chazal tell us, Al ta'amin be'atzmecha ad yom mosecha. Don't be certain about yourself until the day of departure from this world. So people have that sense, that hartung, that lotenschaum, of that principle, then they'll be very careful what they send about. More Torah principles and guidelines for internet safety. Practice privacy by using discretion and understanding halachic difference between Rashuda Rabim, Rashuda Yachid, and Rashuda Karmali. So this private apartment is a Rashuda Yachid, a private domain, a Rashuda Rabim, would be a street, a Rashuda Carmelite would be a um, park or something that people share. Um, and so by knowing those different domains, which are brought out in Masech and Shabbat, um, then I think we're more sensitive to what will be sent around. Uh, be responsible, always conscious, know that there is a seeing eye and a hearing ear, and all your deeds are written in Hashem's book. V'histakel b'shlosha devarim v'yata ba lidei avera da ma lamala mimechav ayin ro'e v'ozen shomeat v'kol ma'asecha b'sefer niktavim. So um, if children are taught that uh, statement from Rabbi Yudah Nasi and Perkei Avot, they'll be more sensitive to not sending things around on impulse. Transparency. Don't use deceptive identities online and pose as someone you're not. There are people that assume totally different names online. You know, disclose biases. Amidvar sheker tirchak and vechietem nikaim. Number seven, be careful of confidentiality. Torah forbids revealing secrets. Megale sod. Torah forbids defaming people by revealing confidential information, such as medical records or uh, educational records or um, legal records or speaking Lashon Ra or Motsi Shamra about them. One may not describe other people or organizations in a bad light. Um, all of this, unfortunately, um, many lawyers don't have any respect for people's privacy of medical records or educational records or, um, you know, uh, other types of records. Uh, and, uh, and they use this for stigmatization in court cases. Do not defame or provoke defamation. Avak lashon ara. Avoid potentially explosive topics. One is not permitted to enable other people to defame. Livnei iver. And masae yede ovre avera. 
Do not troll. Trolling is a positing of inflammatory contents with the intent to provoke and get somebody angry. More Torah principles. Ban on bullying, obviously. Torah forbids causing emotional distress to others. It's called onus devarim. This prohibits insulting, bullying, or causing others embarrassment. Bittel Torah. You know, the time we are lost in hyperspace and spend so much time behind the screen, uh, we're wasting time and taking away from Shalom Bayat. You may not damage the Jewish community by spreading a misunderstanding or incorrupt teachings. Yuf HaTorah and Hillel Hashem. Strive to create a positive image of Judaism, Kiddush Hashem, uh, to the world that is not in the Jewish fold. Practice in Zinus. Um, a lot more can be said about that. I'm going to go to the next Torah principle. The Torah's ways are sweet and all its paths are peace. It's Chaim Hi Lamachazimba Matomachachad Moshar. And so we can apply the Torah's ways to regulating our behavior online to be better. Rabbi Elazar Ben Azari would say, if there's no Torah, there is no common decency. If there's no common decency, there is no Torah. If there is no wisdom, there is no fear of God. If there's no fear of God, there's no wisdom. If there's no applied knowledge, there's no analytical knowledge. If there's no analytical knowledge, there's no applied knowledge. If there's no flower, there's no Torah. If there's no Torah, there's no flower. Perkei Vot 3, uh, Mishnah Bet. Derech Eretz Kadma La Torah, we find in Vayikra Rabba 9.3. There is no wisdom like wisdom of Derech Eretz, a vote to Rabbi Natan 28. Thinking of all your actions in terms of Derech Eretz, Derech Eretz, see Derech Eretz Zuta, about the ways of a Torah scholar. Um, you know, uh, they mention all sorts of things there, how a Torah scholar should dress, how they should behave. Um, if one Torah scholar is following somebody with a safer or a safer Torah, you always follow the safer Torah. Many other little details. Anyone who is a master of Derek Eretz is not learned enough to know more than the Bible. So long as he guards himself against sin, eternal reward is prepared for him. That's in Tan Tana Debe Re'eliyahu Rabbah 2. Anyone who is a master of Derek Eretz and is not learned enough to know more than the Bible, so long as he guards himself against sin, eternal reward is prepared for him. Four things require constant work. Torah learning, good deeds, tefillot, and derech Eretz. That's in Masechah Brachot 32b. Vayelech Moshe. So we learn in Deuteronomy 31.1 that just before Moshe was about to die, he went to speak to all the different tribes, and he went to say, uh, so long. And so Ramban in his commentary on the Torah points out that the word went is extraneous and therefore provides an extra lesson. If Moshe were only saying goodbye, the Torah did not have to add the word went. What Moshe did, according to Ramban, was go around to all the families and say goodbye in a menschlichite way. When you're taking leave of someone, show Derek Eretz an appreciation. You say goodbye like a mensch. Moshe went to do Derek Eretz. So if you're invited to a party or a simcha, don't just, you know, crash it and then leave. You have to say thank you to the guests before you leave. Um, Derek Eretz involves Lashon Naki. Uh, it's not just the power of nice, as one lawyer would put it in his book, or politeness or employing phrases like, please, thank you, you're welcome, good morning, excuse me, I'm sorry, that help you uh, win in a corporate environment of reciprocity. No, it's much more than that. It's avoiding the lascivious, vulgar speech and uh, being conscious of the power of speech. Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi said, a person should never let an unseemly word issue from his mouth. To purify speech, the Hasidim would sometimes take a Tanis Debor. Um, in Pesach 3b, we learn that two disciples sat before Rav. One said, You're, You made the subject as savory for us as a stuffed pig. The other said, Your analysis has made me as tired as a kid, goat, out of breath. Rav would not speak to the first disciple after that, obviously referring to the students as... A stuffed pig is, is a vulgar metaphor for a Jew, so um, that's to be avoided, Rav would say. Um, in punishment for obscene speech, troubles multiply. Cruel decrees are proclaimed anew, and young men of Israel, may such things happen to their enemies, die. And the fatherless and widows cry out and receive no answer, for it is said, quote, Therefore the Lord shall have no joy in their young men, neither shall he have compassion on their orphans and widows. For every one is full of lewd speech and an evildoer, and every mouth makes speaketh obscenity. 
For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. That's Masechet Shabbat 33a. Al Kain al Bechorav lo Yisamach Adonai et Yitamav the et Almanotav lo Yirachem ki kulo chanef umeiraf the kol ped dover nevela every mouth speaks obscenity the kol zot lo ishav apo the od yado nituya so the sages uh, wanted us to attain a level of lashon daki. Derek Eretz Zuta, Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov said, When a handsome and distinguished man allows an unseemly word to issue from his mouth, what is he like? A large dining hall with a tanner's ill-smelling drain sewer pipe running through its middle. So all of this is relevant to internet behavior. You see, you don't want to curse and have obscene language and flaming on the internet. In Ketubot's 5AB, the sages taught in the school of Rabbi Ishmael, Why is the entire ear hard and the lobe soft? in order that when a person is about to hear something unseemly, he can plug up his ear with his lobe. Our masters taught, a man should not allow his ears to listen to unseemly gossip, because before delicate, being delicate, they are of all parts of the body, the first to catch fire. And in fact, for the Chavetz Chaim, one who listens to Lashon HaRa is just as guilty as the one who speaks it. Um, so the Chavetz Chaim is Hilko and Israel Lashon HaRa, need focusing. The Chavetz Chaim lists 31 mitzvot, which may be violated when a person speaks or listens to the Shon Arach. Of the 43 sins enumerated in Al Chet Confession, recited on Yom Kippur, 11 are sins committed through speech. Halachot discussed in the Chavetz Chaim are more specific, basically revolving around the following principles. Lo teilech rachil ba'amecha. Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer amongst thy people. That's from Vayikra 1916. Rashi notes that the word for tailbearer is rachil, which is related to the word meaning merchant. The idea is that a tailbearer is like a merchant, but he deals in information instead of goods. In our modern information age, the idea of information as a product has become more clear than ever, yet it is present even here in the Torah. So they compare a uh, tailbearer to a merchant. Wronging by Onus Devarim. Ye shall not wrong one another, this is Ba'i Kra 25.17, uh, which refers to wronging a person by speech. Velo ta'nu ish et amito vereta melokecha, ki ani Hashem So, um, obviously, Onus Devarim has many different permutations. Ba'i Kra 25.17 has traditionally been interpreted as wronging a person in speech. It includes any statement that will embarrass, insult or deceive a person or cause a person emotional pain or distress. So commentary used examples of behavior that is forbidden. You should not wrong one another. You may not call a person by a derogatory nickname or by any other embarrassing name even if he is used to it. You may not use ask an uneducated person for an opinion on a scholarly matter that would draw attention to his lack of knowledge. You may not ask a merchant how much he would sell something for if you have no intention of buying. You may not refer to someone, to another person for assistance when you know the other person cannot help. You may not deceive a person even if no harm is done by deception. For example, you may not sell non-kosher meat to a non-Jew, telling him that it is kosher even though no harm is done to the non-Jew by this deception. You may not sell damaged goods, mekach ta'ot, without identifying the damage, even if the price you give is fair for the goods in their damaged condition. You may not offer a person a gift or invite a person to dinner if you know that person will not accept. You know, the Rambam mentions in the Maranavuchim that the person who invites people over and and then he acts as if he's opening a new bottle of wine just for them, and, uh, and he was planning to open it anyway. That's a form of deception too. You may not compliment a person if you do not mean it. Um, Parshiot, Bahalocha, and Shelach, Lacha, um, and Korach. So, um, in these Parshiot, uh, there's repetition of Lashon Ra. Rashi notes that the Meraglim did not learn from Miriam's Lashon Ra of denying the uniqueness of Moshe's Nevoah from, from the other Nevi'im. When they spoke Lashon Ra against Eretz Yisrael in, in Korach, uh, in, in, in the, in the Meraglim episode, 
They did not deny that it is a land flowing with milk and honey, Eretz Zavav, Chalav, and Davash, but rather for saying, Ha'arz Asher Avarnu Ba, Lator Ota, Eretz Ochelet Yoshebeha, He, that it's a land that consumes its inhabitants. That was the Lashon Ra, the Motzi Shem Ra. We are further warned in speaking Lashon Ra in Mahmid Bar 17.5, You shall not act similar to Korach and his company who sustained the dispute. Lo Yehieh B'Korach Uka'adato, not Lashem Shemayim, and cast dispersions upon Moshe and Aaron's authority by disparately saying, Rav Lachem Ki Kol Ha'ida Kulam Kedoshim. So examples of Rechilut uh, we find in the example of Doag in Shmuel uh, Aleph, um, chapters 21 to 22. It's often used to illustrate the harm that can be done by tail-bearing. Doag, the Edomite, is used to illustrate tail-bearing. Doag saw Achimelech the Kohen give David the Lechem Panim and Sword of Goliath, a completely innocent act intended to aid the leading member of Saul's court. Doag purposely reported this to Sa- Shaul. Doag's story was completely true, not negative, not secret, and Achimelech would have told Saul exactly the same thing. In fact, he did so later. Yet Shaul misinterpreted this tale as proof that Achimelech was supporting David in a rebellion and proceeded to slaughter not one, but all of the Kohanim of Nob. So Doag is a bad guy in that portrait. Arachin 15b, a person who listens to gossip is even worse than the person who tells it because no harm could be done by the gossip if no one listened to it. It has been said in Eretz Yisrael that Lashon Ra kills three people, the person who speaks it, the person who hears it, and the person about whom it's told. Uh, but that wonderful Perkei vote of Hillel who saw a skull floating in the water, somebody who kills somebody by Lashon Ra or Motsi Shem Ra, uh, that just as they drown somebody, they will be drowned, the Mishnah says. A brighter was taught in the academy of Rabbi Yishmael. Whoever speaks Lashon Ra proliferates iniquities equivalent to three cardinal sins, idol worship, illicit relations, and Shafak Damim, murder. Zorat, the prohibition of Lashon Ra is stated clearly in Torah Deuteronomy uh, Chof Dalin. Take heed concerning the plague of leprosy, because it is a punishment for Lashon Ra. He shamer benega hatsarat the shamor maod the la asot kechol asher yeru etchem hakohanim haleviim kasher zevitim tishmaru la asot. Remember what the Lord your God did also unto Miriam by way, by the way, as you came forth out of Egypt. Specifically, she spoke against her brother Moshe. Moshe, zechor et asher asa Hashem. Um, so prohibitions of res- repeating Rishon Hara are very serious. Deuteronomy 19.15, One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin, because unlike in a court for monetary matters, the testimony of a solitary witness is not binding. So this testimony, his testimony, damages the defendant's reputation without any beneficial result. Lo yakum eid echad bi'ish l'chol on l'chol ta'at chatat b'chol chet asher yechata al pi shnei edim o al pi shalosha edim yakum davar. It is forbidden to say negative things about a person, even in jest. It is likewise considered a shade of lashon hara to say positive things about a person in the presence of his enemies, because this will encourage his enemies to say negative things to contradict you. A mere wink or a gesture can catapult a communication into Lashon Ra. See the Chavetz Chaim more for gestures and winks that do that. Verses cited that prohibit speaking Lashon Ra, or when Rechilud is spoken include Exodus 23.1 You shall not utter a false report. Acceptance of a false report also follows from this. Lo tisa shema shav al tashet yadecha im rasha L'chiyot Eid Hamas. Leviticus 19.14 Before the blind do not place a stumbling block. This applies to both the speaker and the listener of Lashon Ara, since they are helping each other violate the commandments. Lo tit kalel charesh ulifnei iver lo titain mikshol v'yirata me'elokecha ani Hashem. 
So the Chavetz Chaim is enumerating Pesukim from the Torah that he is arguing, and rightly so, are uh, prohibitions to enhance our uh, never speaking Lashon Ara. So verses cited to prohibit repeating Lashon Ara, or when Rechilud is spoken, continue in the Chavetz Chaim's uh, lexicon or categorization, classification. Leviticus 19.12, You shall not hate your brother in your heart, referring to the contradictory behavior such as acting friendly, but then speaking negatively about them behind their back. Um, Leviticus 19.18, You shall not take vengeance or bear any grudge against the children of your people. Lo tasok et yerecha velo tigzol. You may not uh, speak against someone in anger or for something that was done against the speaker. Um, lo takom velo titor et b'nei amecha. So the Chavetz Chaim is citing that Pasuk, Leviticus 19.17, You shall not rebuke your neighbor and you shall not bear sin because of him. Okeach tokeach et amitecha velo tisa alav chet. This verse contains two mitzvot. Stop someone from speaking the Shadra and don't embarrass him in the process. So note, rebuke is not a simple topic, especially because the one being scolded may not always listen. This is covered in some detail in the section, second section of his book, Hilchot Rechilu, refer, referring to the Chavetz Chaim. Verses cited that prohibit speaking Lashon HaRa again. Leviticus 19.18 V'ahavta Recha Kamocha I have a whole paper on this Pasuk itself. Um, a lot could be said about it. Note it has a Vav HaMafuch. It begins, And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So the Vav HaMafuch says you have dirties to yourself. Uh, not to commit, you know, uh, bungee, dump, bungee dumping, put yourself at risk and make tattoos and hurt yourself. Um, you have, And you have duties to yourself, then to your uh, family and then to the world, the Jewish community at large and the greater world. But Tzedek Tishpot et Amitecha, in justice so you judge your people. Deuteronomy 10.20, to him and by implication his wise ones, you shall cleave. Et Hashem Kecha Tira. Oto Tavod Vo Tirabak Uvishmo Tishavea. Um you shall not follow a multitude to do evil also. The above two commandments refer to keeping good company, which includes those who will refrain from improper subjects in their discussions. Lo tihe achre rabim laraot, the lo tane al riv the tot achre rabim le chatot. So the Chavetz Chaim is citing all these ethical injustices about Bein Chaver Lechavero. The Mishnah in Baba Metzia 3310 notes, Just as there are wronging in buying and selling, so there is wronging with words. One should not say to someone, How much is this item if he does not want to buy it? If someone was a penitent, one should not say to him, Remember your past deeds. If someone was descended from proselytes, Gerim, one should not say to him, Remember the deeds of your forefathers. For it is stated, and you shall not wrong or oppress the proselyte. So we mentioned the three parshiot about Moshe, Lo Kam Yisrael Ka Moshe, O Navi Um Amit, and Timunato, and Miriam spoke ill against her brother. We mentioned Korach spilling, sp- uh, speaking ill against Moshe and Aaron's authority, and then the Miraglim speaking ill against Eretz Yisrael. Uh, the earth swallows up the inhabitants. Uh, that's all seen as instances of Lashon Hara or Motzi Shemra, according to the Chavetz Chaim. Um, now, uh, we have the mission in Baba Metzia 3.10, remember your past deeds. You should not remember it's a penitent in, in that regard. The Gemara in Baba Metzia 53a elaborates, how then do I explain the verse of a man should not wrong his fellow? It must deal with verbal wrong. The argument continues in Baba Metzia 58b, where we learn Rabbi Yochanan said in the name of Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai, verbal wronging is greater sin than monetary wronging, i.e. price fraud. For concerning this verbal wronging, it is stated, and you shall fear your God, whereas concerning this monetary wronging, it is stated, not stated, and you shall fear your God. And Rabbi Elazar says the verbal wronging is more serious for another reason. This, i.e. verbal wronging, affects his victim's very self, whereas this monetary robbing affects only the victim's money. Rabbi Shmuel ben Nachmani said, With this, i.e. monetary wronging, restitution is possible. But with this, verbal wronging, restitution is not possible. So the Chavetz Chaim says that verbal wronging, onus mamon, uh, devarim, 
uh, is like taking a feather pillow and just like releasing all the feather pillow, all the feathers. You can never recoup it. It's irreversible damage, verbal wronging. Atana taught the following Braita in the presence of Rab Nachmani Bar Yitzhak. If anyone makes his friend's face turn white from shame in public, it is as if he had spilled blood, <coughs> murdered his friend. He, Rab Nachman Bar Yitzhak, said to uh, the Tana, What are you saying is right, because I have seen how red coloring leaves the face of an embarrassed person, and his face turns white. So, I'm now going to cite from Baba Metzia, Perak Rivi E, um, and we're going to recall, Amar Rabbi Yonatan, Mishum Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai, Gedol Ona'at Devarim, Great is the sin, verbal wronging, Me'onanot Mamon, then monetary wronging, Shezen Ne'amar Bo V'yir Ata Melokecha, V'zen Lo Ne'amar Bo V'yir Ata Melokecha, Rabbi Elazar Omer, Ze Bigupo, Ze Bimamono, Rabbi Shimu Bar Nachmani Omar, Ze Nitan Lehashi Shavon, Ze Lo Nitan Lehi Shavon, Tenei Tana Kame, De Rav Nachman Bar Yitzak, Kol Hamel Vin, Pin, Pene Chavero Barabim, Kilu Shafoch Damim. Anybody who embarrasses his fellow in public, it's as if they killed him, spilt blood. Amar le Shapir ka Amarta de Chazena le Dazel Semuka de Ate Evara. Evara. So um, here we see that humiliating somebody in public is called Azil Semaka de Ate Havara. The features lose their red color and turn white. The Talmudic term for humiliation is halbanat panim, whitening of the face. The Talmudic phrase <coughs> ke shifach damim uh, is uh, like murder. The discussion continues in Baba Metziah 59a where we learn David Amalek's retort to his inter- tormentors included the admonishment that one who shames others in public for casts, forfeits his eternal reward, alam abba. This notion is in fact stated authoritatively a number of times in the Talmud. Commentators offer several possibilities to explain the basis for such a severe prohibition. The merit of Tamar not to embarrass Yehuda in public. So Baba Metziah 59a, Sugiya continues with noting the merit of Tamar. And Mar Zutra Bar Tovia said in the name of Rav and others say, it was Rav Chana Bar Bizna who said in the name of Rav Shimon, Chasida, and others say it was Rav Yochanan who said in the name of Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai, the Rashmi, it is better that a person cast himself in a fiery furnace than that he should shame his fellow in public. From where do we know this? From Tamar. For it is written, and she was taken out to be executed. She sent to her father-in-law Yehuda the pledges he had left with her, but she refused to shame him in public by naming him as the father of her child. So we learn from Tamar's. Rice's action not to embarrass people in public, particularly. Rabbeinu Yonah and Rambam. Rabbeinu Yonah and Shari Teshuvah identifies embarrassing others as avat ritzicha, a subcategory of murder. The Rambam in his Purush Allah Mishnah observes that shaming others does not appear to be a prohibition that one would intuitively associate with such a severe punishment as losing one's portion in a lamaba. However, the action is indicative of the nature of its protagonist. One who would engage in such behavior, writes the Rambam, can only be one of low character and underdeveloped morality, an individual whose behavior in general will inevitably result in spiritual condemnation. Thus the Rambam, who declined to impose martyrdom to avoid humiliating others, apparently feeling the homicide humiliation comparison to be non-literal, non-literal is here loyal to that position. In his view, the transgression itself did not earn the punishment, but rather revealed a personality who will prove himself in other ways to be deserving of such. The Tashbaz. Rabbi Shimon ben Zemach Naran notes, in the process of humiliating another, one commits two distinct transgressions, evolving from two different passages in the Talmud. The first is the topic of Talmudic text cited earlier by Mitzvah 58b, Onus Devarim, verbal oppression, 
subsumed within the biblical prohibition, a man shall not oppress his friend. The Talmud displays an exquisite sensitivity to the potential of even an accidental misplaced word to cause great anguish. This attitude is also evidenced by countless enactments of the rabbis designed <coughs> uh, shalo libayesh, not to embarrass, the alshak and the tikkune teshuva and the Pene yeshua. If the prohibition of verbal oppression addresses the hurt feelings and emotional scarring caused by embarrassment, another element of the offense yet remains to be covered by you shall not bear iniquity because of him. In addition to the pain felt by the humiliated individual, there is the completely separate component of the stripping away of human dignity, the lowering of status within society. In this respect, it would seem more likely that the degree of publicity attendant to this incident would have a direct effect on the severity of the offense. This follows along the lines of the aforementioned comments of the Alshak, the Tukune Teshuba, and the Pene Yeshua, Rabbi Falk. The divine image, the source of human dignity, has been compromised when people are embarrassed in public. So it's at this juncture I'd like to turn to uh, questions of privacy, because people can be embarrassed uh, when privacy, which is a value upheld in the Torah and the rabbinic text, is violated. Um, Midrash Rabbah interprets the serpent, Satan, as a voyeur of Adam and Chava that the, the serpent, the Satan, in Gan Eden was uh, speaking Lashon HaRa as a, and a voyeur to Adam and Chava. Um, Yosef was careful not to have anyone outside his family be by privy to the tension that existed between the brothers. The Das Zekenim explains his thinking. Why let Mitzrim know that there had been no bad blood between the brothers? for the Egyptians would be host to the brothers and their descendants, and this pejorative info could hurt the Jews in the long run. Clearly, Halacha considers that whenever possible, a person's, person's private matters uh, should be uh, uh, private. Achron's dignity is preserved when the Torah is publicly laned and the verses relating to the sin of the Egel Zahav are not to be translated aloud so as not to embarrass Aaron HaKohen. Dubbin censors Yoab for violating privacy rights and causing civil war and chaos in the ancient Israel state in the Bathsheba's affair that Yoab made public. Jezebel stole the boat's vineyard. She wanted his Steachuza, his ancestral state. According to the Talmud, she marshaled many, many false witnesses, close to seven or eight hundred. And according to the commentaries in the back of the Gemara, before Nabot was executed on this false testimony, she uh, made him sign a document and he was offered a fair price. That's called legal subterfuge. So um, the boat his rights were violated um, in her theft of his ancestral state, Steachuza, within his private family relationships. Because the Steachuza is a family possession across generations. She violated the privacy and private aspect of the family as well as committed uh, murder in the first degree premeditated and then covered it up. Uh, the privacy of one's communications by letter or otherwise is one of the four rabbinic categories of privacy. Privacy from trespassers and visual privacy and number four, prohibition of disclosure of secrets is the fourth category of privacy in rabbinic law. Prohibition on reading others' letters. One of the Takanot attributed to Rabbeinu Gershom reads, one should not read a friend's letter, and some versions add, without his knowledge and without his permission. Um, privacy of letters and emails. It is customary in rabbinic culture to write on an envelope, um, that uh, meaning the harem of the Rabbeinu Gershom, or pagin, pe gimel yud nun, someone who breaks through a fence that rabbis erected may be writ bitten by a snake. See Kohelet, chofetz gumatz, Yipol, Yiforetz, Geder, Yishkenu, Nachash. So, privacy is very important in rabbinic ethos. Arucha Shulchan, privacy even of a postcard. The Rucha Shulchan in Yeridea 334.20 expresses ambivalence whether it is permitted to read a postcard addressed to someone else. Apparently, Rabbi Yechiel Michel Epstein of the Torah Temima um, feels that possibly the Cherem protects the privacy not just of the author but also of the recipient. Actually, 
Bruch HaLevi Epstein was of the Torah Tamimah. Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, the Ramo in Evan Ezer 110. Ramo concedes, Yes Omrim, that there are those who do not agree but maintain the cherem of Rabbeinu Gershom applies, regardless even for performance of a mitzvah. According to Ein Yitzhak, we follow the first ruling that mitzvah fulfillment, the cherem, may at times be abrogated. The application of this is that if one assumes that Rabbeinu Gershom did not institute the cherem in a situation that would lead to violation of a mitzvah, then the parent would be permitted to read mail of a young person for whom he is responsible, or a principal of a school to prevent harm of an individual to themselves. Usser, to employ spying and entrapment for suspect in violating privacy rights. Jewish law addresses the power of law enforcement to use surreptitious means to discover a perceived communal threat. The Talmud notes that even for capital offenses, with very limited exceptions, spying and entrapment were not permissible means to discover the intent of a would-be suspected offender. And Mishnah Sanhedrin 7.10 is cited. Uh, this Mishnah outlines a narrow exception in the case of idolatry, where privacy the rights should not be regarded by policy of their supposed sus sus suspects. The rabbinic criminal justice laws are overwhelmingly protective of the rights of defendants, and guilt cannot be based on circumstantial evidence or testimony, uh, testimony of only one person. Im b'machtaret yimatze haganav v'huka v'amet ein lo damim im zarcha hashemesh alav damim alo shalem yishalem im ein lo v'nimkor begenevato so this is the classic case of if a thief be found breaking in. Um, I refer you to one of my lectures that I published on previously, just on this one Pasuk, and I look at it through all many rabbinic texts, over a hundred rabbinic texts, and uh, it's so complicated. But in the end, the halacha, regardless of going with Rashi or not, or the majority view, the din is that an owner who kills a thief engaged in breaking in is not accounted as a murderer. The owner is deemed as acting in self-defense and is not even a messiah le davar avera, accomplished to a crime. So Rashi, in a, in a rare case, was sort of the minority opinion. He asked, has the sun shine upon him? If the, if the thief was breaking in, in the middle of the day, you, you can, Rashi says, know their intentions. If it's at night, uh, you don't know their intentions, so you have more leniency to kill the thief breaking in, etc., now, the privacy of a friend's house. One should not enter a house, even one's own dwelling, without a warning, like, Hi, I'm home. Rabbi Shmuel Bar Yochai, Shimon Bar Yochai states that God hates four things. And a person who enters his own home suddenly, and there's no need to add his neighbor's house. The Midrash relates that Rabbi Yochanan used to be clear his throat before entering Rabbi Hanina's house in order to make sure that he wasn't invading anyone's privacy. Rabbi Akiva commanded his son Yeshua seven things. My son, do not enter your house suddenly. How much more so your friend's house? In Shemot 40.35, Moses could not enter the tent of meeting, whereas in Vayikra 1.1, Hashem spoke with Moses in the tent. From this we learn that a person should not enter his friend's house unless his friend, Hashem, says enter. Leviticus Rabbah 21.8, the Margolius edition. See that. Privacy of a debtor from a creditor. When you make a loan of any sort to your fellow, you must not enter his house to seize his pledge. You must remain outside while the man to whom you made the loan brings the pledge out to you. The oral law notes that even an officer of the court may not enter the debtor's house in order to take a pledge. Ki tashe barecha mesha'at me'uma lo tavo el beto la vot avato. So we're mentioning these rights to privacy because on the internet there's no privacy whatsoever. Um, the government after the Patriot Act um, has really carte blanche to spy on people's email and telephone calls. It's really quite a, quite a c c disturbing situation. Way after 1984 and see the film Fahrenheit, the temperature that we'll, paper burns at. The oral law notes that even an officer of a court may not enter the debtor's house in order to take a pledge. Police officers, marshals, sheriffs, detectives are not to invade privacy, even to collect taxes. Disclosure of secrets. So, Mishlei. Holech Rachil Magale Sod, Veneman Ruach Makase Davar. He that goeth about as a talebearer revealeth secrets, but he that is faithful spirit concealeth the matter. 
The riff based on this Pusik in Mishlei in Sanhedrin 3.7 teaches that judges are not permitted to reveal their deliberations after a verdict is reached in a matter. Sanhedrin 31a extrapolates that Rav Ami threw a Talmud out of the Beit Midrash who revealed a secret saying, this is a revealer of secrets, which Rashi says was regarding slander questioning someone's Shabbos observance. Rabbi Eliyahu ben Chaim in Constantinople, 1530 to 1610, ruled that if one of the communal rabbis reveals the secret deliberations of the city council, he is disqualified from serving on the basis of a previous source. How do we know that when a person tells something to his friend, the latter may not repeat it into the person says to him, go and say, as it is written, Vayikra, and God spoke to Moses from the tent of meeting to say, Yoma 4b, the 4th century Samag, Rabbi Moses ben Yaakov Okusi, in Sefer Mitzvot Gadol in the 17th and the 17th century Rabbi Avram Halevi Gumbiner, understand this sugiya to mean that one may not reveal a confidence without express permission of the confider. Published Igorot of Gedolim Hador. The Igorot of Rabbi Moshe Feinstein and Rabbi Yitzhak Kutner and the Chazon Ish, Rabbi Yeshaya Karlowitz. The name of their inquirer in their Igorot, whom these Gedolim responded, was changed to protect their identity. So they changed names of the person writing to them to protect the privacy of the individuals. Jewish Law's Foundation of American Law, Privacy Acts, writes, is something of a theory nowadays after the uh, Patriot Act. The Second Amendment forbids government from quartering soldiers in peacetime in a person's house without consent of the owner. Um, the Fourth Amendment, the right of people to secure in their person's houses papers and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures, i.e. court orders based on evidence of probable cause analogized to biblical law's prohibition of a creditor entering a debtor's home without a debtor's permission. This is why it's so important to know the laws of evidence. You can see if somebody is going on bogus slander, libel, defamation, perjury, and uh, you know bogus accusations, they can say, oh, we have probable cause to ransack that person's apartment and to, to take their computer hard drive to see what they've been working on. Now they can do it remotely, so don't worry. The Fifth Amendment, no person shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. Why Halakha affirms privacy rights? Safeguarding the dignity and rights of individuals who should not be exposed to potentially embarrassing or disturbing matters and embarrassing someone in public in Jewish law is considered a violation of murder. It destroys someone's good name and is likened to a form of Shafach Damim. See Tosafot Yom Tov on Perkei Avot, Mishnah Masechet Avot, Perak Bet. Afhu ra'a gogelet achat shatsafa al penei hamaim amarla al datafat atafuch v'suf mitafuch yitafun. So um, Hillel saw a skull on the waters, and that just as that person who was drowned uh, had said the shanara about somebody, so they were drowned. Mita kenegad mita. The Chavetz Chaisim rules that by telling over even seemingly innocent contents, one may inadvertently cause harm or distress to the writer, and therefore it should not be done. Writing is worse than speaking. If in speaking the the usher, according to the Chavetz Chaim, is to speak Lashon Ra and call the Homer, it is an Isser to speak Moti Shem Ra. Minor on majorists writing it down these strictures apply all the more so. And Shimrat Halashon Lashon Ra, Kalal 2, Note 27. Rabbi Akiva was criticized by Rabbi Yehuda ben Betara for violating the biblical ban on violating volunteering information that is not verifiable, thereby maligning a righteous person. Strict adherence to proper legal procedure is due process of law before a person's life, liberty, and property may be deprived, whereas privacy be invaded by the government. Again, theory, theory in many cases that happen today. David Amalekh and the sin of Yoav's breach of privacy. The disclosure of David's letter to have Uriah exposed in battle was done by Yoav. Yoav waited to kill Amasa also after they had made peace with David, so that the blood which should have been shed in war was shed in peace. Yoav held the sword in his left hand and gripped Amasa's beard with his right hand in order to kiss him. At this point, Amasa was an easy victim to Yoav's trickery, and Yoav is a cold-blooded rotzeach. You find Yoav also killed Abner, Abney and Yoav dropped his dagger as a decoy, as a, as a, like it was an accident. Abner is a nice guy, picked it up. Yoav grabbed him by the beard and stabbed him. So this was a deceitful person, Yoav. 
Yoav's breach of privacy continued. Another interpretation is that Yoav let the bloods of his victims splatter on his belt, his shoes, and his head so that everyone could see that he had killed someone. Far from feeling remorse for what he had done, he was proud of it. It also can be understood to mean that these sins stuck to him like a shoe or belt. Not having repented, there is nothing he could do to cleanse himself of his guilt. So we see from our previous remarks that Yoav had violated the privacy of David Melech in exposing national matters, secrets that should not have been exposed, like the Bathsheba matter and how Uriah was dealt with, um, and other matters such as his treachery in grabbing Asa and Abner by the beard and killing them out of deception. So David cancels, cancels his son Shlomo um, what to do to these two uh, repulsive individuals who broke uh, the laws of privacy. It appears in Haftorah Vayihi. Vayitzah <laughs> Lemorloikarehin <laughs> Tase <laughs> etc. This is the case of uh, David remembering that Shlomo should treat his two enemies, Yoav and uh, Shimi ben Gera, with real politic, because they spilled blood in a time of peace. And Yoav had also exposed secrets, private matters, that almost put Israel, the state of ancient Israel, in a tragic uh, civil war and total chaos. So I want to summarize, the online environment raises many important questions uh, that we did not have time to touch on. The most, with the main thing we touched on tonight was wrapping it up with privacy issues and before that, the way in which the anecdote, the antithesis for Lashon HaRa, Rechilut, and Motzi Shemra on the internet is to follow the laws of the Chavetz Chaim in the Yisrael, Hilchot, the Shonara, the Motzi Shemra. So that this is our lecture of truth. This is our panacea. 
that the same old case law that the Chavetz Chaim is drawing in from previous Talmudic cases and Pesukim in the Torah about ethical behavior in just the Swishin mentioned, the human realm, should and must be applied to online behaviors before you hit the button and send that email or that instant messaging or that chat. Because with one click of the mouse or push of the button on a computer with a Lashon Ra or Motzi Shem Ra, you can murder somebody, you can destroy their name, you can destroy their parnasa, you can destroy their Shidduch, and you can destroy um, their health. So be careful out there, folks. It's a wild west of online behavior. And hopefully we learn from tonight's lecture that we are called to a higher calling in curtailing our behaviors online as we would in the Dasvishan Menschlich, the interhuman, Beinadam Lechavaro. Thank you.